All right, this is night uh, lit, and we are practicing the prologue and reading some more of the prologues. Andrew, take it away. Kuth, let's, let's agree on that. The word is kuth, that is a kuth in sundre lunde. Um, there was another word that didn't sound quite right, but you have, uh, you can look that up and, and work on it again, and we'll try it tomorrow. Um, I think the more we do it, the more, the better we are. So go ahead and turn in the book. I'm not quite sure where we are. Uh, very good. I'll have to, um, I page 19, what do we got to get to? We got to get to 20, 26, that's not impossible. So uh, we, uh, did we not get through the read? Well, like, we read through it, but we haven't read All right, so we have read it. So again, the key thing here is to pick out several things. And then at the end, one of the question asked you, one of the question asked you to kind of group these people together. That's a fascinating exercise because you can group them in pairs uh, you can group them in groups uh, you know like of more than one uh, you can group them in more than one group so that's a, a useful thing all right so let's uh, let's look at this read remember what a read does yes um, a steward of an estate the steward usually involves uh, the managing of domestic affairs especially foods um, buying food maybe maybe the servants uh, are uh, managing the servants, something like that. Um, that's that's what he does. And this particular read, as with most of the characters, has some really good qualities and maybe some not so good. Uh, I'm not sure he has any really that's not so good, but um, you know, no, nobody's perfect. So give me again. You have to think back, look over it, and give me one quality that he has. I know you couldn't write in it, so we didn't read. I thought we did. We didn't read it? No, we didn't. I thought so. All right, so give me one thing. Um, no one that I just caught in the arena. Which means death. So he's, he's not in debt. Unlike the lawyer, remember he said that he was in debt and trying to hide it. This guy has never been in No one's ever caught him in it. It means he's probably a pretty good businessman, Julie. He was pretty thin. Which is kind of counter intuitive in the sense that he's, if he's wealthy but not large so that says something about him um, he doesn't he doesn't spend his money on those kinds of things you know, which is what rich people would do yeah uh, he had a better hand at bargaining one more time he had a better hand at bargaining where did you read that I, I just want to see it it's down near the bottom um Yeah, this is terrible. They don't have line numbers. It's almost impossible. It's about like three fourths down the page. Three fourths. Yeah. Oh. All right. Okay, I get it. Yeah. So, what does that mean? Who's his lord? The person that charges the estate. The guy that owns it. The guy that owns the estate. He's a better businessman than the guy he works for. In fact, did you notice in that same, and right in, right two lines down, what, is he, what does he do for his, um, his boss? 
But listen to what it says. He had grown rich, although he sinned, and had a store of treasure well tucked away. Yet out it came to pleasure his Lord with subtle loans or gifts of goods. The employee is loaning money to the boss. So that, that says something about this guy's skill. He's better at managing money than his boss is. He even, he even loans the boss money, which is, that's ironic. Uh, what else can we say about it? Uh, the first line tells you something. You probably don't know this word, but it says the reeve was old and choleric and thin. You know what choleric means? All right, when we do the vocabulary, you'll learn it. Choleric means irritable. Like he's the kind of person, which I'm not fond of these kinds of people. I hope I'm not like this. I wouldn't, you know, I hope you probably don't like people like this, but you never know if they're in good mood or bad mood. And it can be really quickly irritated and you don't know why. Um, that's this guy. That's not really a virtue. Choleric. It's the first line of his description. Yeah. I think he's like pretty neat because he keeps he says that he keeps keeps his bins and garners very trim while I've got a little bit of a minute. Where does it say this? Uh, it's near it's near to the front after the After what? Um, he kept bins he kept bins and garners very trim is that what you're saying? yeah I know I could like score a point or two, but he had a point or two uh, yeah the out. bins and garners are where they hold the, the food if it's a farm which it sounds like it is that's where they so that's why they store it and he, I mean, he's just organized he's neat I'm looking at my desk right now um, I admire people who can be that way um and I try, but it, you know, after after about three periods, I find out. Okay, I don't know where it is. Um, I just been uh, anyway. He's he's like he's very organized and neat. Knows where everything is. That's a that's a virtue. Anyway, it's a probably good good list for him. Would you say he's admirable? To I don't know about you, but what about to um, Chaucer? Do you think Chaucer admires this guy or not? No. Why? Hmm? Why not? Uh, it didn't seem like he did the way he was describing him. Well, that's what I'm asking. Why not? What is, how does he describe him? Have we said irritable. anything yet about him that was negative? It's the irritable, irritable thing, right? Is what? The irritable thing. Yeah. But how, does that is, does that outweigh every other good thing, or is are there more good things? He he he's neat. He's organized. He's never in debt. He loans his boss money. He is a people are afraid of him. It mentions that kind of with, goes along with the irritable thing. You, you decide. But you could argue that the good outweighs the bad. Um, all right, so let's go on to the summoner. Oh, yeah, good. We're in good shape. We can definitely finish this. Um, all right, the summoner, did we talk about what a summon, what is a summon? You've never gotten one, then. That's good. You really don't want to have to get one. What? Absolutely. Now, if you're ever summoned... Um, as a juror or as a witness, they won't come to your house and give it to you. If, if you're if you're summoned as a witness, you'll get a letter and say you need to be in court by such and such a date, or you'll get it in a letter say you need to report in such a date. You'll for county office or federal wherever it is. Um, that's a summons. You have to be there. You can't ignore it. You can. I, I'll get to it. Maybe they'll come. Well. They claim they'll come after you, literally. I don't know if they actually do that or not, but you don't ignore summons. If you're summoned because you're being accused of something, they will show up personally. Usually the sheriff deputies will do that. They'll come and um, as soon as they hand you the paper, as soon as you pick, you know, touch the paper and pull it, the clock is ticking. You know, they can't arrest you until they find you. They can't summon you until you've been alerted that you're gonna be summoned. So. Uh, that's why some people try to avoid the sheriff deputy or whatever. I mean, if you're a murder suspect or anything, that's different. We're talking about smaller crimes like that. But uh, uh, that's what a summoner does. But this guy works for the church. Uh, remember, they have a church court. And the church 
court has cases that they deal with. So that's what this guy is. He works for the church court. So he's the one who sends out the he, He's the one who delivers them. He's not the one who issues them. The, the one that issues them is usually the archdeacon of the church. He's the big guy right under the archbishop. And so he, he delivers them. But you'll find out that this guy is very corrupt. And you'll see why. Anybody volunteer to read it? All right, listen. There was a seminary we discussed that in. His face on fire like a cherubim. Very, he had car, car, car buncle. Diocese. He knew their secrets. They did what he said. He wore a garland set upon his head, large as a hollow bush upon his face, outside outside an alehouse. And he had a cape, a round one, which was his joke to wield as if it were intended for a shield. All right. As usual, we can find several things to say about this guy. I've given you some hint. He's not. He's not. He's a corrupt man. So, what can you say about him? A man that can. Let's say it this way. He had horrible complexion. Um, now, remember we said this about but there were the monsters were ugly, you know, deformed creatures. Um, the bad guys don't always look that way. The bad guys often look better than the good guys. And that's why they're so successful being a bad guy. Here's a case where this guy looks like the outside, what's on the inside. Uh, he, he's not very attractive. Uh, he has this terrible complexion. He, well, I won't say any more. You tell me. Um, he, like, drinks a lot. He's a drunkard. So he's a drunkard. Uh, it mentions something else about the man's breath. I mean, if you're around people that drink a lot, you don't have to get close to, I hope you're not. You have to be careful. Why would you be around people that drink a lot? But you know, I just remember, and fortunately, I've never had to be around people in college, maybe. Um, but you get you get close enough to them, you can smell it. You can smell beer, whatever it is. So it has a smell to it. But what else does this guy take in that smell? Yeah. Uh, he eats garlic. 
Yeah, leeks are kind of like onions. So his 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 breath is not very good. His appearance is not very good. Um, children are afraid of him. <laughs> the guy walked in. It's not like uh, Home Alone where they were all afraid of the, the the old guy living next door, who turned out to be a really good guy. Um, this guy really is a bad guy. He looks like it and he acts like it. He says he was lecherous. Do you know what that means? It means he's sexually immoral. You wonder what's so attractive about him, right? Now, we're, how is he corrupt? There's no law against smelling bad or looking bad. There's actually no law against being lecherous. Um, but what does he do that's... Uh, it's like he stones someone or whatever, then he'll let them get away with it if they yeah. just do him some stuff. So he takes bribes. And he's in a position, he's the guy that you see. You don't see the judge, and you don't see the archdeacon. You see this guy. So this is the guy that comes with the summons. He takes advantage of that and says, listen, I know what you're doing. I know you and so-and-so, and, -so, and, and I, I'll have to just tell the archdeacon, and you're going to be in court, but there's something you can do about it. And so you see how he manipulates people? Uh, it's like blackmail. I guess it's kind of like the Internet. You find out things about people. You can use that against them if you were a nefarious person, which you're not. Um, and it sounds like he has some, he says he has trenches of his own to feather. And in other words, I think that's a, that's a, what's the word? I, uh, it's a, um, anyway, it's a word that what he means is he's probably got girls on the side. Um, anyway, that's, that's who you're dealing with. That's at least the third person from the church that isn't very good, maybe fourth. And so we're about to see a fifth. Who's also not very good. Would you like to read it? The pardon. The pardon. Yeah, he he does literally that. He is supposedly authorized to uh, receive pardon uh, or give pardon. So uh, I think that means he can pardon you from your sin. Uh, but again, you can see the opportunity for for uh, for corruption. Um, and so we'll see what he's like. How well he read a lesson of Holy Story, but best of all he sang an offertory. For well he knew that when that song was sung, he had to preach in turn his heavy tongue and lily hood was silver from the crown. Now that's why he sang so merrily and loud. Um, what 
Can we say about this guy? He's like an entertainer for money. Uh, yes, he sang. And he had a real high voice. Um, kind of unusual for a man, singing voice. But what else do you know about? Him? No. Blonde. Didn't say blonde, it says yellow. I think of yellow. Right. Blonde. Or yellow, yellow, yellow. Um, you know, whatever yellow is. You know, uh, that doesn't necessarily look great uh, on a man. But it's also yellow is wax. What would that say about his hair? It was as yellow as wax. It doesn't sound very plain. Um, and, oh, wait, and then that goes with, like, um, it's something about rat tails. So yeah, yeah like, that was another he, thing. What else? His <laughs> eyes bulge. <laughs> um, what else can we say about him? I mean, so far, again, nothing corrupt. There's no, nothing corruption about, no corruption about this, but we do get to that. What else do you notice about him? Big eyes. Right. Yeah, he likes, he sang for like money, that's what he sang. So he's very materialistic. He would sing for money. And the fact that he he sold pardons and indulgences, most of those people were corrupt. You could make money from that. You know what an indulgence is? You will learn. Indulgence is uh, when the church in, in the Middle Ages believed that if most people died and you were a churchgoer, you would go to purgatory, not to heaven. Only the saints go to heaven. And only the, the terrible, really terrible people go to hell. Most people go to purgatory. You will eventually go to heaven. Burn off your sins. But you have to work them off. And so if you want your ancestor, your ancestor, yeah, your great-great-grandfather to spend less time in purgatory, you would buy an indulgence. And that would, they could cut off 100 years. So whoever is in charge of it. If it sounds crazy, then I, I can't argue with you. Um, but that's how it works. The idea seems radical. That's just the way to think. The only thing I can understand about purgatory is if you're a Protestant, a believer, you understand that we're saved and all saved people are saints. You don't have to be St. Francis of Assisi or anything like that. Um, so all saints go to heaven, directly to heaven. Um, so, all, but in the process of life between the time you're saved and the time you go to heaven, you are being sanctified. You are becoming more of a, of a, a true believer. Can you explain it? Mm, kind of. I mean, so for us, like there's like three levels. There's hell, there's the purgatory, and then there's heaven. The and three levels of hell? No, like that, no, there's gotcha. like just three, three gotcha. levels. We, this is Dante. Heaven, Dante does the same thing. There's heaven, there's purgatory, and hell. And then in hell, there's like different levels. Yes. Anyway, so in the purgatory, though, when you die and you have sins and you are, let's say that um, that you aren't able to, like, tell the priest that you're sorry for your sins, right. there's, um, like, there's an imagery that some people have made that it's, like, holy fire. Like, it doesn't burn you, but it burns your sins, and you can hear it, like, hear, like, voices and, like, screams, like, coming off of you. That's, like, your sins burning off of you. And then after that, like, it depends, it depends, like, what your sins were. If they're severe, that that you couldn't go to heaven, but you don't go to hell. Like, you stay there for a while until they're all burned off. There's a name for that, the kind of sin that... Um, that There's moral... That you cannot... Moral. Yeah, you cannot be forgiven, or yeah. it's so bad I you go to hell. I think that's venial? It's yeah. something called venial? Venial, yeah. And then Which moral, is that? Venial is, like... The worst? Because I think, yeah, but, but I get confused with one of them, you cannot be, like, forgiven. That's right, it's yeah. It's terrible, and then the other one, you can't be forgiven. And you go to purgatory, and you, how did you put it? Burn like, them off? You burn them off. Like, it doesn't burn you, like, your soul. It burns off your sin. And, and so, uh, I don't think indulgences are part of the church anymore, but in the Middle Ages, they were. And that's why Martin Luther, one of the reasons he rebelled against the church, because he realized how corrupt that was. Because what they were doing with the money, they were building St. Peter's Basilica, which is down there. They were using the money from the indulgences to build something and he, he, he disagreed with that so thank you for that explanation was there anything else mm, that's all really so when we read Dante it would be very helpful we won't read purgatory but um, Dante follows that model and so 
I appreciate that. That's helpful. Anyway, that's what this guy corrupted. He would sell things and um, make money off of it. Um, he lied. It says he flattered and he lied. So, uh, oh, so he used he used relics. What were relics? sacred items, and he would claim they were something, again, with no proof, but he would, so that's a bit of a lie. Uh, more than likely, he doesn't have St. Basil's tooth, or he doesn't have a piece of cloth from Mary's veil. That's more than likely, he wouldn't have those things. It's kind of creepy to think about it. Like, you just go around collecting body parts from dead people. Well, your, like, they're not body parts. They're things that the person wore is or is associated with them. Is it a tooth? Oh, okay. Like, oh, you're only oh, that's true. Tooth. That is a body part. Yeah. He's spooky. Yeah. He carries around dead people's stuff. That's what we're talking about. That's he would carry these relics in the bag. So he can see them. All right. All right. So we are finished with the pilgrims, but we're not finished with the with the prologue. So I need somebody to take it from there because we have a couple pages left. Anybody want to take it before I ask somebody to read? Ben, would you read? Okay, we're on page 22, and he now, um, Chaucer now comes, focuses on the party as a whole and the plot of going to Canterbury, and um, you can take it from there. Our host gave us great welcome. Everyone. Hey, where are you? Oh, oh, no, now. oh now I have to stop. Sorry. Now I have told you shortly, in a clause, the rank, the array, the number, and the cause of our assembly in this company. In Southwark, at the high cause hostelry, hostelry? Hostelry, yeah. Hostelry. Known as the tavern, close beside the bell. And now the time has come for me to tell how we behaved that evening. I'll begin after we alighted at the inn. Then I will report, then I will report our journey, stage by stage, as a reminder of our pilgrimage. Well, I, first I beg you in courtesy, not to condemn me as unmannerly, if I speak plainly and with no concealings, and give, a, and give account of all their words and dealings, using their very phrases as they fell. For certainly, as you know so well, he who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say as nearly as he can. Each single word, if he remembers it, however rudely spoken or unfit, or else the tale he tells will be untrue. The things pretended and the phrases new, he may not flinch, although, if it were his brother. He may as well say one word as another, and Christ himself has spoke broad and holy writ, yet there is no scurrility scur 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 in it. And Plato says, for those who, re who read with those with power to read, the word should be as cousin to the deed. Further, I beg you to forgive it to me, for I, if I neglect the order and, de and degree and what is due to rank in what I plan. I'm short of wit, as you will understand. All right, so here, uh, Charles issues a disclaimer. What's a disclaimer? Some kind of uh, warning of what's coming. It is a warning, right. And what is his particular warning about? There's yes. going to be bad words. Just don't blame him for yes, he says, if I say any kind of bad words or describe something that you don't, you think that I shouldn't, I didn't make, it's like he's telling us, it, not me, he said it. He's actually the one who's writing the whole thing, so it's very clever. Now, can I give you an illustration? Uh, when I was a teacher at Page, this, uh, this has never happened at Caldwell, but uh, it happened on occasion that a student might call another student by a bad name or might have even called me a bad name, which happened once, once or twice. And so as calmly as we, I can do, I would take a sheet of paper and I'd say, uh, Mr. Jones or Ms. Jones, Billy called Johnny or called me a bad name, sign and put my name. So I send Billy, the guy who said it, to the office, and I send Johnny with the note later because Billy would never deliver the, the note. So um, five minutes later, here comes the guy with the note, Billy with the note from the principal. And on the note it says, tell me exactly what he said. So now I get up my pencil, I say, Billy called Johnny a blank and blank, 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 exclamation point, and sign my name. And so I send it on, because sometimes, I, the principal is saying, what's a bad word? That could be anything, maybe it's not really a bad word, maybe 
so tell me what you heard said, and so I'll get the right, all those four little words that he said, and then send it back up to the principal. That's what he's talking about here. Sometimes you can't mince words. You have to say it exactly, like you're in a court of law. Tell me what he said. He said a bad wolf. Tell me exactly what he said. There's sometimes you have to be precise, even if it's, it's not nice. So that's what Chaucer is saying. I didn't say it. He said it. It's not me calling the guy those blankety blank words. It's what I heard said. Sometimes you just have to say it that way. Second thing I want you to note, and I want you to write it down. Yes. Is there an anti bad word law of home law? Are you writing a list of words you're just not allowed to say? Um, I think it's common sense and common decency. And if I heard them saying, I'd do the same thing I did at Page High School. I'd say, that's not, we don't talk like that. I, I've told you this before. The first year I was at Caldwell, the best thing about it was I could walk through the hall and not hear those words because where I was, you'd walk down the hall, you'd hear everything, just people casually talking to each other. I'm not talking about people fighting or that happened too, but just on a regular basis, people banning. You're so fortunate to be in a place where you don't hear that because it's, it's demoralizing and it brings you down. And to be in a place, it's almost like you can breathe. I came to Caldwell, I thought I could take a deep breath now because the hall isn't you know, filthy uh, and I don't hear it. It's like people are treating each other with respect. That, that means a lot. Um, all right, one other thing I want you to write down and that is, it's on the second page, page 23. Sorry, I want to put your name there. It says, find it, it's the top of the page 23. The word should be as cousin to the deed. And you can, you can copy that down or you just listen to me. The word should be as cousin to the deed. Plato apparently said that. The word should be as cousin to the deed. Uh, what do you think he means by that? Remember the context of what we're talking about. He has to write the words down that he hears. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the words have to match the deed. If you... D E E D S. The action. The words have to match the action. You know, if you wrote a story and you had these two guys beating each other up and say, You're a tattletale, said, You're a mean person. You know, these two rough guys with scars on their faces, and, you know, you're a very bad person. You know, that's not what they're going to be calling each other. They're going to be using some really strong language, and you either, you either write it like that or you don't write about it at all. It's kind of. I mean, if you're writing for kids, you can clean it up and everything. And um, if I write, I'm certainly not going to use that. Um, that's not going to be my audience. But yeah. Um, so you want to train that down and then look at it tomorrow? Well, that's what it means. What does it mean? It means that your words should match the action. The other thing we said, what is the disclaimer? You need to explain what, what we mean by that. Uh, Gibbon, you want to read about our host, just the next thing? Everybody, anybody have a question? All right, so Griffin's going to read about the host. He is number 31. There are 30 pilgrims, but then the host represents the 31st person. He's not a pilgrim. Go ahead. Our host gave us great welcome. Everyone was given a place in central Michigan. We served the finer, finer, big shores and big things. The line was strong and we were glad to hear a very striking. more he was a married man after our meal he built a new man in August 
All right, so the host is, is suggesting the, the contest, which he'll, he'll elaborate on in the next stanza. Remember the contest? Okay, he's going to go into some details, but um, he, uh, he is the perfect guy or host because what's, what do we know about him from this description? He, didn't have any, he wasn't missing anything. He was a manly man. He was pretty. He said he had girth, which means width, so he's not a, he's not a small guy. What else did he have that made him a perfect host? And we're not talking about some some woman hosting a meal, a hostess. We're talking about a guy who's going to be in charge of 30 pilgrims headed uh, to uh, Canterbury. What other qualities? Um, well, he's, he's well off. He's all right, yeah. Did you notice anything else? Though? All right. He's affable, which means he's friendly. He's sociable. You wouldn't want your host to be quiet and timid. He's... What? Yep. I mean, you got to know about him. So yeah. So he's uh, he's large enough. He's he has the personality for it. Um, he's bold. He's wise. So he's a guy that you would want as a host. And then he volunteers for that. So um, Julie, do you mind reading uh, starting on page twenty-four, just the next stanza? Is it well our opinion? Yes, it is. Well, our opinion was not long deferred. It seemed not worth a serious debate. We all agreed to it at any rate, and bade him issue with what commands he would. My lords, my lords, he said, now listen for your good, and please don't treat my notion with disdain. This is the point. I'll make it short and plain. Each one of you shall help a, shall help to make things live by telling two stories on the outward trip to Canterbury. That's what I intend, and on the homeward journey. All right, so what is the contest again? Thank you. What's the contest? Can you tell the best stories. All right, who, so what will they win? Meal. And who will decide who wins? The host. And how many stories will they tell? 30. Four. Four. Two each. Two each yeah. up and two each yeah. back. So Four. total of? Four. Total of how many? Four. Four. Two oh, each. If it's 30 pilgrims, oh, how many? Oh, you mean like everybody. Yes, everybody. Oh. Total. How many people are there? 30. Yeah, 120. I don't know if Charles really meant that. That sounds like an exorbitant amount of stories to write. Um, but he never finished it anyway. So we don't. He, only, he only wrote 24. Of them. Wait. Did you say wait? You, you did say wait, did you? I mean, that's a banned word. It's we no longer. Some organization came out this year and said words that must be banned. Well, it's, no, it's, it's, it's to you. Everybody said. Hold on, hold on, please. Slow down. So, you know what? These people that we just all know, all the different people that have all these different job titles, they're going to be the ones telling all the. Yes. Yes. There are 24 stories told by 24 pilgrims, but the, the plan was to write more than that. And we don't know how many more. The, the host suggested this outlandish number, 120. I think that was, I don't know how one person would write all those, but uh, he never lived. It took him uh, 14 years to do these. Wait, does it say that the says that, yes. It's, I'll show sure where it says that. Um, uh, what does it say? Um, Imagine having a host to oh, 120 yeah. stories and then have him pick which one would be best. By telling two stories on the outward trip to Canterbury, that's what I intend, and on the way home, we're going to journey them and other details from the days of old, and then the right. stories for children. What are the two requirements of the stories? 
Yeah, me too. Both. I mean, either way, the, the winner, everybody tells a story, must, and their story must have these two things oh, in it. Those who want to be shall pay for what we spent upon the way. But when you tell the story, it has to have two. It has good morality and general pleasure. So it has to be entertaining and it has to be educational in the sense that it, it, it has a moral. So most of the stories will have that moral. Um, so we, we are in great shape to finish this tomorrow and start the, the nuns pre-sale, which will take all of next week, but by the end of next week, not not that one until we have three, by the end of next week we'll be ready to announce a test.